You know, some of the ancient tribes that still exist, like the Hamza mm -hmm. tribe, are there any studies on them and, and the mm -hmm. effectiveness of their diet? Because they mostly mm -hmm. eat meat. That's a great question. Uh, I just spent time with the Hadza, actually. I just got back from No Tanzania. way. Um, and I've also interviewed Herman Ponsa, who is an anthropologist that's lived with the Hadza, published peer-reviewed papers. And you know, I find it funny that someone like Herman Ponsa has less airtime talking about the Hadza and their diet than someone like Paul Saladino, right? Herman Ponsa is the domain-specific expert. That's who we should be listening to. He's an anthropologist. He spent time living with the Hadza, the Maasai, the Chamane in South America, observing their diet, weighing the food that they're eating, looking at their blood biochemistry and their cholesterol levels, all of the things. Wow. Uh, I'll come to his research in a moment, but just on personal reflection, my time with the Hadza, I found it fascinating that there was a morning where they were going hunting. So we all went out to observe their hunting. And I can tell you it was slim pickings. The only animals that we saw in that entire time were these tiny little birds, of which they missed all of them with their bow and arrows. And, you know, in speaking with them, and this could be because of encroachment of communities and a change in terms of the amount of wildlife that exists there. But in speaking with them, you know, I got the the sense that these images you see online of the Hadza with a big kind of a big kill, that a lot of that is set up. You know, people go there, they say we want to eat a lot of meat and they curate that. So I'm not sure it's really representative of the Hadza. And I think that's corroborated by Herman Ponce's data. And certainly the Hadza eat meat, absolutely. And if you look at his data, he plots over every month of the year, the contribution of calories from meat, from honey, from berries, from baobab, tubers, mm. etc. And you know, across the year on average, 65% of calories are coming from carbohydrates. Huh. Okay. And that means that more, ca more than 65% of calories are coming from plant foods because you're also going to get some protein and some fats from, from plant food as well. And the contribution of meat changes across across the year depending on on the month when they look at their cholesterol levels they're super low oh like 70 milligrams per deciliter and is that that's considered more beneficial than having high cholesterol right obviously. so that's at that level where you don't really see atherosclerosis so then you start to wonder well okay what type of meat are they eating clearly it's not super high in saturated fats because we're not seeing like what we see in that four-week study where people did the low carb, the women did the low carb diet, high saturated fat, and have extremely elevated LDL cholesterol levels. And that's in line with you know even Lauren Cordain who wrote the Paleo Diet book. He's published with Stanley Boyd Eaton, who are, are really two of the kind of uh, father figures of the Paleo movement. And even in their peer-reviewed literature where they write about ancestral diets, they talk about how lean that meat was, how low saturated fat was in the diet and how high fiber was hmm. in the diet. And so in, the, in Herman Ponce's, one of, one of the reviews that I'll give you to put into the show notes, he has this beautiful table and it shows you the contribution of calories from carbs, fats, and protein for the Hadza, for the Maasai, for Chamane, and their LDL cholesterol levels. I think that gives us a, a, a kind of a lot of information as to how these people are, are eating. And it's not the same as it's depicted on social media. At least how, not long, how long are they living? We asked that question. We had this this beautiful kind of ceremony and then we're able to, to do a sort of Q&A and there was a translator there and their response was they don't, they don't track their age. Oh, wow. That must be nice. <laughs> and there's no public health records. Mm. So it is difficult to know exactly how long they're, they're living. They tend to to remember things like the season that they were born was it was it wet or was it dry? Those mm. kind of things, not not the year, and they're not counting the years as they go by. 
Did you notice a difference between how the men and women were eating by any chance? The women, you know, tended to, from what I saw, were eating more tubers and berries and and these sorts of foods. Um, but again, they didn't. They weren't able to actually catch anything when they went hunting. So, I think rather than what did I see on one day, I think Herman Ponce's research, where he spent years with them looking at monthly intake, is probably a more accurate reflection. So I'm I'm sort of careful not to extrapolate too much mm. from from my um, experience with that. But big picture. I guess the other question that we have to ask is, I think there's this assumption out there that whatever our ancestors ate is, is, must be best for us. Right. But I find that, that hard to kind of reconcile or understand that position because our ancestors had certain foods available. They're different foods to us today. And what we can say about their diet was that Whatever they were eating, they were able to get to an age to procreate, to survive. And really that's what evolution cares about. Can you get to an age to procreate so the species can continue to evolve and be sustained? It doesn't speak to whether or not the, that food selection is best for longevity. That's a completely different question. That's something that I think we need, you know, modern science, we need to then come back to today and say, okay, it's interesting to look at what they consumed that allowed them to procreate. We have a whole wide range of foods available to us today and we also have science. So we can make more informed decisions based on the different goals that we have. We're not going through life just trying to survive to the next day. You know, we're in this, I guess, relative position of privilege where we can make choices and, and forecast and think about our long-term uh, health outcomes. 